Well, good morning, church. It's, uh, it's always a blessing to be in the Word, whether here in a sanctuary or at home in your living room. Wherever you find yourself this morning, uh, with your loved ones or with your pets or whoever it might be, we're just glad you've joined us. My name is Andrew Robertson, and I want to start off with a question this morning, and the question is very simply this. How strong is your faith? Some people might even ask in the opposite degree, how weak is my faith? And quite often we find ourselves talking in these terms and even maybe getting a little too fixated on the idea of faith, especially when it comes to unbelievers who uh, might look at us like a neighbor did just recently and observed in my own life that you're a man of faith. I remember Stephen Curtis Chapman, a well-known Christian musician a few years ago, when after he had lost, he and his wife Mary Beth had lost their daughter, and they were being interviewed by Larry King, and just during one of the intermissions, Larry King turned to Stephen Curtis Chapman in total amazement, and he said, Stephen, I wish I had your faith. Even atheists and skeptics who want to challenge Christianity and challenge Christians quite often challenge on the idea that, well, you have a blind faith. So it's probably a good question, but I'm going to try and present today that it's a bit misleading to think of Christianity in terms of of just your faith, whether it's strong or weak, or whether you need more of it or less of it, and so on, or whether it's blind faith or it's not blind faith, there's something more important we need to be asking than how strong is your faith. What we really need to be asking is, who is your faith in? Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting with your life? with your soul, with your eternity, because that determines the strength of faith. So let's look at it this way. Faith without an object, faith without something to look at and trust in, faith without an object is self-defeating. People who say, well, I'm just a person of faith. Faith in what? That's what's missing in the equation. You can't have faith in your faith. But secondly, faith in the wrong object is deadly. Just like if you were to trust, really trust, really have strong faith in a bridge that's made out of toothpicks, it's not going to hold you out of the Detroit River. But faith or trust in someone who is trustworthy, who will not let you down, is secure, satisfying, and strengthening. So there are two factors that determine the maturity of Christian faith, the enjoyable, the enjoyability, maybe we could say, of Christian faith. First of all, your faith is only as reliable as its object. What are you trusting in? Or more importantly, who are you trusting in? Your faith is only as strong as the object. But secondly, your faith is only as enjoyable as your view of that object. How clearly do you know the one you're trusting, and how clearly do you see him? A number of years ago, I was in Winnipeg, and uh, I was boarding an early flight to come back to Toronto, come back home, and uh, we all boarded the plane, and uh, of course, they pushed us back out of the gate, and the pilot was starting up the engine, started up one engine, and then started up the second engine, and as he was starting up the second engine, it was very very uh, quickly we understood something was wrong because the, the smell of smoke was right through the whole cabin. Smoke and airplanes don't go together. And uh, so it wasn't very long before the pilot came on and told us all we were getting off the plane. He was pulling us back into the gate and, and we would be deboarding for the time being. And I remember watching uh, at the window in the terminal as they pulled the plane back again and they started up the engines and of course the professionals, the engineers were watching everything happen and the pilot started up the engine and shut it down and started it up and shut it down and every time he did there was this billow of smoke that came out the back end of that plane. You can imagine how I'm feeling at this point. And then they pulled the plane back to the gate 
And the pilot came up and he told the lady at the desk, he, in a very loud, very confident voice with the stripes and on his shoulders and the wings on his, on, on his uniform, he told her with all the confidence in the world, I'm, I'm completely confident this plane is safe, we can start boarding again. And off he went down and uh, boarded the plane himself. Now, I was uneasy, but I could see for myself that this pilot, with his uniform, with his credentials, with all the years he would have spent training and with the experience that he had built up over time, he knows what he's talking about. Not only that, but he was getting on the same plane. It wasn't like he was saying that and walking the other direction. He's getting on the plane. He's going to lead us on the plane and uh, my uneasiness started to go away. Why? Well, it turns out, because I'm standing here right now, it turns out that he was trustworthy. And it also turns out that I was able to enjoy my flight home because of my trust in him as a trustworthy object. See how that works? My trust in him. My flight was enjoyable because of my view of the object of my faith. Now we're going to turn to the Scriptures. In fact, we're going to turn to the Gospel of John, and as we do, I want to remind us why John wrote this Gospel. So John's Gospel is the fourth book in our New Testament, and John tells us exactly why he was writing. At the end of it all, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these signs are written, John says, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what is John trying to do? Before we get into John's gospel, a section of it, we need to understand that what John wants us to do is, is to check the credentials of the pilot. He wants us to enjoy the flight. He wants to point us not to merely a strong faith, but to a strong Savior, to someone that we can trust in. And as we see him clearer, that's what John's going to try and do. He's going to try and get us to see him clearer. And as we see him clearer, we learn to trust him more and more. So we're going to turn to John chapter 19. And as we break into John 19, we are looking at this with one question on our mind this morning. What does a vibrant, mature, steadfast Christian faith look like if we are focused less on faith and more on Jesus? And as we turn to this text, we're going to pray. Pray with me. Lord, I just ask this morning that you will show us that you will show us who Jesus really is as we examine your word. That as a result, our view of Christ would be clearer, Father. And that our faith would be strengthened. So bring, your, bring us to yourself. And bring to yourself those who do not know you yet. And Lord, encourage us all in these uncertain times that our faith might be strong and that we would be secure and be able to enjoy these moments in which you are teaching us, in which you are glorifying your name, that we would be able to trust you even when we don't understand. Lord, help us as we turn to your word. Show us who you are, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, five things. Five things we're going to notice. John 19, we're going to break in at verse 17, and as we break in, what we're going to do is we're going to look at five things that John wants to tell us about Jesus in this text. It all centers around Jesus being on the cross. It's the most crucial part of the, the, the Gospel of John, he's been leading us here. He's been giving us all kinds of commentary leading to this point. And now we're going to see five things about Jesus that should sharpen our faith, should allow us to have a more secure, more steadfast hope and confidence in Christ. 
Here's the first one. We're going to notice that Jesus is central, so focus on him. Verse 17. Notice the end of verse 16. So they took Jesus, verse 17, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Now what's noticeable about what John has to say here is not merely what he says about Jesus, but what he doesn't say about other people. It's very interesting that he says next to nothing about the place other than what it was called. He doesn't tell us very much about it at all. He doesn't tell us much about anyone surrounding it. Other gospel writers did. One of the gospel writers told us about a man named Simon of Cyrene who happened to be passing by and they got him to help Jesus carry his cross. John doesn't tell us about that. He's not focused on that. He doesn't tell us much about the two others that were crucified with Jesus other than the fact there were two others. But he does tell us that Jesus was between them. He was in the middle He's in the focal point. He's central. He's central to the picture. John is focusing on Jesus because he wants us to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God. He doesn't want us distracted by anything else. We're not to look to anything else or to look to anyone else. So here are some things we need to learn right away about the object of our faith. First of all, we need to understand that if Jesus is to be focused on, then the object of our faith is a person. He's personal. John is especially interested that his readers believe or trust, not in a dogma, not in a doctrine, not in a theology, not in a religion or a set of beliefs, no, he wants people, his readers, to come into personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The object of Christian faith is personal. But secondly, the object of Christian faith is historical or visible or available. He's available to all. John is writing, and uh, quite often he, he emphasizes and he focuses on the skeptics who really were not very convinced about Jesus at all. One of them, back in John chapter 1, his name was Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's buddy Philip comes to him and says, You know, Nathaniel, we've been searching for the Messiah for a while, and I found him. I found him. I want, you to take you, I want to take you to him. His name is Jesus, and he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel kind of scratched his head a little bit. He's been reading through the Old Testament Scriptures for a while, and he said, uh, Really? Can any good come out of Nazareth? Anything? He's skeptical. And Philip just says, come and see. He's available. Come and see. Come and talk to him. Come and check his credentials. Talk to him. Get to know him and see whether he's trustworthy. Right at the end, at the other end of the story that John writes, is a man named Thomas. Thomas has been observing Jesus for a long time. But after Jesus dies on the cross, Thomas Here's all the stories about the empty tomb and Jesus rising from the dead and all of his friends were telling him that they saw Jesus literally, physically, alive from the dead. And he said, I'm not going to believe that unless I can take my finger and drive it into his wounds. I'm not going to believe by merely seeing. I need to actually touch this. I need to make sure he's not a ghost. Of course, when Jesus shows up, he offers himself to Thomas and says, Thomas, here you are. I'm available. Thomas, it's not very long before Thomas is saying, my Lord and my God. You see, faith, this kind of faith, in this kind of historical available Jesus is not blind faith. The Bible doesn't invite us to believe in a fairy tale doesn't invite us to believe in something. We can't check the artifacts. We can't check the evidence. We can't check what actually happened in all the other historical documents that are out there. We can check. He's available. And the object of our faith not only is available, but we have to remember that the biblical historical Jesus is not the Jesus of your imagination or your opinion. 
not the Jesus that never confronts you with your sin. He's not the Jesus that's described by the skeptics and the liberal scholars. And he's not the Jesus of other cults and false religions or anyone else's opinion. It's the Jesus of the Bible, the historical Jesus that died on a cross and rose again. John also wants us to focus on Jesus as central and not be distracted by anything else because in Christian faith, this focus is transformative. So many people are so focused on measuring their faith. I have a weak faith. I have a strong faith and so on. Or, or focused on past sins and past guilt or maybe present addictions and trying to control their sin and so on. But part of repentance is actually turning away. It's, it's the acknowledgement, I can't accomplish, I can't achieve what God's standard, perfect standard is. I can't achieve it. So I turn away from it completely and I turn and fix my eyes completely on Jesus Christ and nothing else. And you will only experience victory in your walk of faith as you focus more on Christ than you do on trying to control your sin on your own strength. Like the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, that we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed from the, into the same image, into the image of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. So turn to Jesus Christ. Fixate on him. You know, quite often uh, I've experienced this in life when I have fallen to temptation, when I've fallen to sin, and the devil starts to accuse me, and I feel that weight of guilt on my mind. It's so easy to start focusing in. Why, why did I do that? Why did I let that happen? I should have done this. I should not have done that, and so on. And there's a hymn that I've learned to turn to because it focuses my eyes on Christ. It's a hymn by Charity Bancroft, and the second verse of that hymn says this, that when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, am I going to focus on that and sit there and wallow in my guilt? No. The hymn writer says, upward I look to see him there who made an end of all my sin. And because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. So where am I going to look? John says, He's central. Focus on Him. But secondly, He's mighty, so surrender to Him. Notice verse 19. Let's keep reading. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Well, many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the King of the Jews, but rather that this man said... I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It's staying. It's not going away. Now this is amazing. Because at this point, Jesus is stretched out on a cross. And uh, just like billboards down the 401 that warn us about you know, crimes that could be committed, don't drink and drive and so on, and don't follow too closely. And sometimes they even put up the amount the fine would be if we should break the law in certain ways. In the same way, the Romans had a propaganda uh, scheme that they used. And when they put people on a cross, it wasn't merely an execution, but it was a message. They were sending a message to everyone on busy highways. It was like a billboard. Just a slightly more gruesome billboard. And over top of the crucified individual would be written a, a, a description of their crime against Rome. 
And what the Romans were saying to the people that were passing by is, don't you dare. You do this, and this will happen to you. Now, this is interesting propaganda. It seems as though Pilate was a little spiteful against the Jewish leaders that had politically twisted his arm when he wrote this over Jesus. But the irony must not be missed. Because you see, the Jewish leaders had done everything they could to slander Jesus' reputation as Messiah. Done everything they could. They tried to trip him up in his words. They tried hard questions, and they couldn't seem to trick him in any way. They lied about him. They falsely accused him. They twisted the reality about him. They spat on him. They laughed in his face. They humiliated him publicly. They tried everything they could. They gave it their best shot to erase any notion in people's minds that Jesus could ever be the Messiah and the King of the Jews. And here's the twist. Because you see, as Jesus is crucified on this major highway, that in every single language, so people, all kinds of people from all over the world could understand what is being written, his crime is posted above him, and it is this. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, there's kind of a double meaning here, because you see the reality behind it is, no matter what the Jews tried to do, the Jewish leaders religious leaders tried to do to crush that reputation. They couldn't. There's nothing they could do. They tried to challenge him. They tried to crush him. They tried to get rid of that title and that reputation. There was nothing they could do to get rid of it. Nor would they themselves bow to it. I think the lesson is quite clear. Jesus is the king of the Jews. In fact, he's the king of the whole world. And you can try and crush that idea. You can try and deny it all your life, but he's still the king. He's still the king of the universe. And Paul, the apostle, actually told a church in a Roman colony. A Roman colony was like a mini model of Rome in all of its glory with all of these retired generals who had fought in these wars and had great war stories to tell. And Paul speaks into that Philippian culture and he says, listen, I want to tell you that God has highly exalted Jesus not Caesar. And he has bestowed on him a name that is above every name, not Caesar's name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, even Caesar's in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you recognize, do you recognize his absolute authority over your life? This is part of Real, vibrant, living faith. Faith in Christ is marked by surrender to Christ. Not merely a focus on him, a, a wonder about him, but do you understand, do you recognize his absolute authority, or do you still think that you have options outside of his will and his plan for you? All right, let's move on. Number three, it's just going to get better. Number three, he is sovereign, so rest in him. John wants to tell us that he is sovereign, so rest in him. Listen, God is good, and God must and will and is working out his plans for, for all and through all of history. And I may not understand, you may not understand all that's going on that he's doing but you and I can rest in the sovereign control of our great God. You say, how do we know this? Watch this. Verse 23, let's move on. Verse 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus. Now, who looks like they're in control here? The soldiers or Jesus? Jesus is on the cross. The soldiers are the ones that put him there. It looks like the soldiers are in control. They took his garments, and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, just seems like a random conversation, they said, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. 
Well, what's the significance of that? Why bother telling us that story at all? Well, John explains. This was to fill, fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So, John says, the soldiers did these things. Why did they do these things? What is John trying to say? Did they do these things because they were just having a random conversation and it just made sense to gamble for this coat? Or did they do these things because the God of the universe, who is sovereign over all history, said they would do these things? There's an amazing mystery in this. But it seems clear that what John is telling us is that even as Jesus is on a cross, nailed, he can't physically move. The soldiers at the foot of that cross, in a random conversation, by their own free will, are actually fulfilling everything he had purposed for them to fulfill. Because you see, King David... Over a thousand years before this event, right here in John 19, had written these words, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Do you see what's going on here? That these men were actually fulfilling what Jesus had said they would fulfill a thousand years before he was on this cross. So the one on the cross doesn't only know what to do for today, but he is in control of all of the universe, for all of time, of every detail, and every second is under his total control. John wasn't sitting at the, at the bottom of the cross with a checklist of prophecies, just checking them off one at a time. Okay, there's another one and another one. He wasn't doing that. But later on, as he's writing about this and reflecting on this and really thinking through, is Jesus the Messiah? He's going back over the Old Testament scriptures and he's starting to realize Jesus has actually fulfilled everything that was ever written of him. In fact, 300 plus different Old Testament prophecies written centuries before the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, all fulfilled in one solitary person. So living by faith not only requires focusing on him and surrendering to his authority, but living by faith in this moment means resting in his sovereign control over this moment, even if this moment is not easily understood. Even if I may not recognize or realize or really calculate or understand why does God have me in this moment, it seems like everything is out of control. Nothing would have seemed more out of control than the Son of God on a cross. But in the very moment the Son of God is on a cross, his very purposes are being fulfilled. He's in control, he's sovereign. So rest, just rest. In this moment, wherever you're at, rest in his sovereign control. There's not a government in the world that is outside of his sovereign control. There's not a leader in this world making a decision at this time that is not outside of God's sovereign control. So rest in that. Rest in that. Whatever happens, God is in it. He's in control. Here's the fourth one. Let's keep moving. He is compassionate. John wants us to know he is compassionate, so trust in him. Verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which was a reference to John. John often referred to himself in this way in his own story, his own narrative of Jesus. When he saw his mother and John, the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. 
Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that John at that moment left with Jesus' mother, Mary, and went home. It just means that from that moment, John adopted her and saw her and treated her as though she was his own mother. He adopted her. He cared for her. Because after all, Jesus would not be here as the eldest son to do so. I don't know where his other brothers were at this point, but Jesus on the cross with everything else going on and all the agony and the suffering he's in is actually looking at someone else, his own mother in the crowd and caring for her, providing for her, giving her exactly what she needs in her darkest moment. Now, this is great because this goes beyond sovereignty. Sovereignty isn't a great comfort when we're suffering. We may be able to rest in it, that's true, but the idea when we are suffering and in deep pain, the the idea that God is sovereign, he's in control, well, in some sense that gives us stability, it doesn't feel that close. There's something about it that seems distant, far away, that yes, he might be in control, and yes, he might be working something out for his glory down the road, but in this moment, I just need someone to be close to me. I need someone to embrace me. I need someone to comfort me. I need someone to provide for me tomorrow. I may have lost my job. And, uh, and God being sovereign and in control of that's great, but what are my kids going to eat tomorrow? That's why John doesn't leave us just at the fact that God is sovereign, that Jesus is sovereign as the object of her faith, but he also shows us that we can trust him to provide in every moment, in every situation. He is providing for us. And his presence in every circumstance, his notice of us makes the difference. He's compassionate. So trust him. Trust him. Trust him with the next hour, The next day, whatever the future might hold, however dark the future might be, or even if it's bright right now and you're not quite sure what is around the corner, trust Him. No matter what situations we come into in life, He will give us what we need right when we need it. We can trust Him. Well, that leads us to the last one, the fifth one. And John wants us to know that Jesus is victorious, so celebrate him. Celebrate him. Look at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, accomplished, he said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. One of the other gospel writers actually tells us that he cried with a loud voice. So here is someone who's right at the brink of death. And before he dies, One last time, he proves what he had already said. John records for us back in, I believe it's John chapter 10, that no one, he said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And we have this one final scene before he gives up his life of Jesus crying with a loud voice and saying, it's finished. And those words are really what ought to cause every Christian whose eyes and mind are focused on Jesus, whose hearts are filled with Jesus, to celebrate, no matter what the circumstances are in life, that there is a joy that cannot be taken away from us, it cannot be robbed from us, because Jesus on the cross finished what he came to do. He came to take away our sin. Listen to what he said in John chapter 10. The thief comes only to steal steal and kill and destroy the sheep. But I came that the sheep may have life 
and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What is Jesus doing on the cross? What is he actually finishing? What is he working towards that he's finally saying, I'm done. It's accomplished. There's no more to do. What is he doing? He's paying for our sins. This was actually a term, a word, a Greek word, to telestai that they used to find on, that they found on receipts. When one person paid the other person and an invoice was given in the early centuries, that the one person would write on that invoice, the seller would write, to telestai, paid in full, accomplished, complete. It's paid. It's done. There's no more to pay. It's like when your mortgage is paid off, your house is paid off, you want to throw a party. It's finished. I don't have to make another payment next month. It's all complete. The problem is the debt of my sin, your sin, we couldn't pay. We couldn't even begin to pay it. And the idea that we think we can pay it, it means that we don't understand just how costly our sin is. Jesus comes as the only one qualified to pay it, and he dies on the cross. He suffers God's wrath to pay in full what we couldn't pay, to be punished completely. So Satan has given it his best shot. He tried keeping Jesus off the cross. And then he tried destroying Jesus on the cross. And now there's nothing left that Satan can do. He has thrown every weapon he has at Jesus. And Jesus is victorious through it all. He hasn't sinned. He hasn't turned away from his father. He hasn't done one thing to displease his father. Through it all, Satan is done. There's no more that he can do. It's finished. The war is done. Jesus has won. God the Father pours out on his Son anger, righteous anger for my sin, for your sin. He pours it out on his Son until there's nothing left and it's finished. And all the requirements, notice verse 28, Jesus knowing that all things were now finished or accomplished, he said to accomplish the Scriptures. Everything that the Scriptures had said, all those credentials that the Messiah must complete, that the Messiah must accomplish to be who he really is, all of that Jesus accomplished. He fulfilled the Scriptures completely. It's all finished. <laughs> Isn't that worth celebrating? Isn't that worth throwing a party in your living room today? Because it's completely finished. The, the major problem with the world is not COVID-19. The major problem with the world is this disease called sin that infects all of us and is destroying our souls. And Jesus comes and he finishes the cure to take that sin away. That's worth celebrating. You imagine what would happen if the news broke today in the headlines that COVID-19 was finished. I know that's not how it's going to work out. At least that's what they say, that we're not all just going to go running out on the street and celebrate and throw neighborhood parties. It's not going to work out that way. We're not going to have some fireworks show to say, hey, it's done. I get it. Do you imagine? Imagine if someone in the world was capable of taking the entire disease, the entire virus on themselves, and through that one sacrifice, the entire world was free, healed. No one else had to worry about it anymore. No more fear. No more panic. None of that. It's finished. Imagine the celebrations in the street. Can you imagine the gratitude towards whoever that individual was, the object of that faith? He's victorious. It's finished. There's no more praying we have to do. There's no more... No more working, striving we have to do. We need to look to him. He's done it. It's finished. So celebrate. Well, listen. This is what a mature faith in Christ looks like. And it's not about the strength of your faith. It's about the strength of your Savior. It is characterized by as we keep our eyes focused on him, this kind of faith. Maybe you've met people like this. I know at times in my life, 
I know of people in my life that were just marked by this. You couldn't talk with them for five minutes without recognizing this kind of focus on Jesus, this kind of surrender to Jesus, this kind of rest in Jesus' sovereign control, this kind of trust that Jesus would provide everything for them, and this kind of joy that no matter what happens in life, my sins are gone and I'm ready. I'm ready for the next world. And that to live is Christ, to die is only gain. Maybe you've met somebody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. If you are, we're thankful for that. God is glorified by that. There's so many examples from history of this kind of faith. Even right back to King David. Do you remember how King David wrote Psalm 23? And he's writing about the Lord Yahweh. John actually tells us that Yahweh, the Lord, in the Old Testament is Jesus in the New Testament. And uh, so David is actually writing indirectly about Jesus. And and he's saying, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's talking like him, him over there, Jesus. He's pointing us to Jesus. But when he gets to the point in his darkest moment of suffering, and he says, you know, even though I walk through the valley of of the shadow of death, even though I walk through that in my darkest, darkest moment. He doesn't say, you know, he over there, Jesus is with me. No. David's faith was marked by that extreme closeness and that focus on the object of his faith, that trust. He wasn't looking at himself. He wasn't saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I believe my faith is strong enough to hold me. He wasn't saying that. He wasn't preoccupied in that way with anything inside himself. He was saying, no, 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 this is personal. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, you, Yahweh, you, Jesus, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's so personal. It's so close. It's so intimate in that moment. David was marked by this kind of faith. So many others. I mean, Polycarp, the ancient elder of the church in Ephesus who was being coerced to offer incense to Caesar and by doing so to deny Jesus as Lord. He was being told, either do this or die. And Polycarp responded and said, you know, 86 years I've served Jesus and he has never done me harm. Never done me harm. How then will I blaspheme my king and my savior? He wasn't sitting there saying, you know, my faith is strong enough. Bring it on. No, he was completely focused. Jesus isn't going to let me down. So here's the question to end. To think about. To really examine ourselves. Do you have a strong faith? Or, maybe it's better asked this way. No, no, not do you have a strong faith. Do you have a strong Savior? Do people look at you and say, well, I wish I had your faith? Or will they look at you and say, I wish I had your Jesus? I wish I had someone so trustworthy that I could look to in the storms of life. If that is you this morning, then embrace it. Enjoy such a view of Christ that keeps your heart warm. Maybe, though, there are those, and especially at a time when we're all locked in our homes, it's quite possible that we can grow cold. We're not around others in the church as much as we should be. And, you know, Zoom calls can only do so much for us. And maybe our hearts are growing cold. We're starting to kind of wander, starting to get distracted, starting to kind of uh, just binge on Netflix or whatever it might be. And uh, we're not as focused on Christ anymore. And we feel the anxiety starting to just creep up in us. And we're feeling the worry and the fear and, and the control and the anger maybe and the irritation and the anxiety, and we have our kids at home with us, and whatever it might be that's just crowding in on us. And I just want to ask us again this morning to think this through. Are we focused on Jesus Christ? Are we waking up in the morning, spending time with him? Are we going to bed, speaking to him? Are we following through our day, whatever it is, just looking to him to provide, trusting and resting in his sovereign control? 
Maybe there are some of you who are realizing, I don't have this faith because I've been so focused on faith. I've never really understood the Savior behind it. If that's you, you need to repent and come to Christ now. And if you're wandering, repent and turn back to Christ now. And if you're walking with Him, be encouraged and keep walking with Him through all of your days.